Hey, uh, thanks, and it's great seeing you all again. Yeah, I just want to give you a, just a quick up, update on uh, what's transpired over the last 72 hours, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. I would just tell you up front, uh, as you know, the, the uh, operation is pretty dynamic. We've got a lot of moving parts, so uh, I will practice uh, good operational security. So if you ask me a lot of micro-tactical uh, questions and locations and numbers, I may not tell you those, so just a warning up front. Uh, as you know, uh, the, the, uh, the attack uh, started a, a few months ago. Just to give a kind of a background, as, as you recall, the last time I did this, I think, was in May. Uh, Ramadi had, uh, had fallen. Uh, that's when uh, we, we got here, and the uh, liberation of uh, Ramadi had uh, just, just commenced. And so since that time, over the last eight months, if you look what the Iraqi security forces have accomplished, you know, the Euphrates River Valley is clear all the way uh, up to Haditha, and uh, the 7th Iraqi Army Division just cleared the northern part of the Euphrates, and we haven't had an attack uh, in the Euphrates for a number of days. Uh, if you look in the, the, a little bit to, to the east of that, Fallujah is cleared. Uh, they did that pretty rapidly, as you all remember. In the Tigris River, River Valley, they attacked up. We uh, seized, they seized uh, Kiara West Airfield, put a bridge in, seized Kiara, Sharkat, and uh, have now commenced the operation to liberate Mosul. Uh, when I got here, a lot of uh, thought was that would not happen until January. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that the Iraqi security forces are on their way now. Uh, to, to start, we've, uh, as you know, we have three real lines of operations here. We uh, provide uh, the uh, training for these 12 uh, counterattack brigades that are involved in the fight. Uh, that's a coalition effort of the 19 coalition countries that are part of uh, CJ Flick. Uh, we also provide lethal fires by both air and ground, and then we advise and assist. Those are the three things that uh, CJ Flick does to enable the Iraqis. So for the, the liberation of Mosul, as you know, we have been supporting the Iraqis for the eight months we've been here, but it wasn't just something that we did in the 101st. As you recall, 1st Infantry Division in our sent, uh, followed by the 82nd and 3 Corps, and now the 101st and 18th Airborne Corps. This has been something that has been building from all of our predecessors, and they all should uh, be happy today because they had a big role in enabling us to help the Iraqis get to Mosul or on their way today. Uh, we've been shaping Mosul, uh, as you know, for about six or seven months, could do uh, a lot of strikes on a wide range of capability that the enemy has, you know, their financial, their oil uh, revenue streams, key leaders, uh, a real holistic targeting uh, effort. Uh, prior to the uh, engagement uh, starting or the operation starting, you know, we continue to shape in Mosul uh, with uh, those lethal fires as well as conducting some fires in the axis that the Iraqis are taking uh, to go uh, up along uh, the, their axis to attack Mosul. This is really a joint effort between the, uh, the Kurds and the Iraqis. Uh, as you've seen in the news, a lot of great uh, coordination between both of them. This is the first time in five rotations here in Iraq that I've seen the Kurds and the Iraqis co uh, cooperate, uh, the tactical assembly area, occupations, and then conducting the, uh, these attacks uh, with the uh, uh, Kurds, uh, Peshmerga, and the Iraqis, really conducting joint planning and uh, enabling this operation to uh, commence. So as the operation started, you know, we provided some good lethal fires uh, uh, to degrade uh, primarily command and control was our first uh, real series of targets uh, to get after that leadership's ability to communicate. We had done that for the Sharkat uh, clearance as well as the Kiara clearance that had some really good effects for that, uh, limiting their ability to pass uh, information or orders to the fighters on the ground. Then we attacked uh, their military capability, really VBID produ production uh, sites, some of their weapons caches and, that, and their their key headquarters were the things that we started to strike, you know, a, a number of weeks ago to set the conditions. As the uh, the uh, operation started, as you've heard, the uh, Peshmerga started to clear some of the areas uh, to the uh, north and uh, and uh, really east, and then the Iraqis began the uh, their attack on multiple axes. Uh, the enemy, as we've seen over the last uh, few months, they are unable to. Uh, seize any terrain. Their, their attacks have been an attempt to, to spoil Iraqi security force maneuver. 
uh, which they have uh, been very unsuccessful in doing. The initial uh, uh, operation, as you've seen, the movement has gone uh, pretty well. Uh, the Iraqis are, are ahead of where I thought they would be when this uh, operation started. They, can, they continue to move and continue to liberate villages. Uh, I think the last count yesterday was 13, and they continue to, to move uh, towards Mosul. Uh, the enemy is uh, primarily response has been indirect fire. We saw the first day of the operation a lot of uh, V-bids, vehicle-borne IEDs along uh, the axis. In the yesterday, we we did some great strikes, uh, defeating them, destroying them before they could get into the Iraqi positions. Uh, saw a little bit on the uh, eastern axis today, uh, but primarily we see uh, in areas like Karakush. The burning uh, buildings, which we assess to be their headquarters, and a lot of them are moving back uh, into Mosul proper. Uh, we've defined this uh, battle space really as a disruption zone that the enemy is in that really uh, goes really north of Kiara and probably you know just to the west of uh, where the uh, Kurdish defensive line started, expecting the enemy to continue to delay and then uh, try to uh, preserve their combat power so they can get into Mosul and potentially uh, to uh, make a defense, but they've been uh, fairly unsuccessful at this point. Uh, displaced people we were worried about initially. We've not seen large numbers of displaced persons leaving uh, these villages. In fact, a lot of the villages, uh, as the Iraqi uh, security forces have come in, have, in a, have helped the Iraqis. Uh, there was uh, some villages where the people came out and showed where the dash was, uh, which was really encouraging for the Iraqi security forces. Based on their information operations telling Dash to leave, uh, tell people to stay, stay at home, stay uh, undercover. Uh, that would be the best protect protection they could get, and so they've been fairly successful in uh, liberating and keeping the displaced persons uh, located, and then it, continuing to move. Uh, the the next 24, really, I'd say the next 72 hours, we expect the Iraqis will continue their push. Uh, continue uh, some more operations from the the Kurds to clear some more of that uh, really defensive line, that limit of advance, and the, the Iraqis continue in their push to Mosul. There's been a lot of questions about how long uh, the operation would take. You know, my my assessment is the enemy always has a vote. The, they've been there for two years digging in. We have got indications of obstacles. You know, these T uh, walls, concrete walls, a lot of trenches, and a lot of berms. Uh, so they've been preparing for this fight for two years. So as we've seen, the closer they get to Mosul, the, the harder it will be. But make no doubt the Iraqi security forces have the momentum, and they know it. And so they are as motivated to get to Mosul as we are to help them get there. As far as the enemy inside Mosul, you've heard numbers of about three to 5,000. Uh, you know, the, the numbers I, I don't pay a lot of attention to. We've seen uh, movement out of Mosul. We've got indications that leaders have left. Uh, a lot of the foreign fighters we expect will stay because they're not going to be able to exfiltrate as easily as some of the local fighters or the, the local leadership. So we expect there will be a fight. Uh, but, you know, I, all I can tell you is there are fewer uh, fight, uh, Dash fighters today than there were yesterday, and there will be fewer tomorrow than there are today. Uh, I am confident that the Iraqis are up to this task. They've uh, rehearsed it, clearly not at the scale that uh, Mosul is. Uh, Fallujah was a great example of what they had to do. They learned a lot of lessons, specifically in uh, how to isolate, how to screen displaced uh, persons, how to do that fight. I expect the enemy is going to give up terrain until they can get into the complex urban areas of Mosul, because that's where they can offset some of the technological advantages we have. Uh, but we've been successful in striking them. I just want to highlight this is a this is an operation that that uh, consists in CJ flick of 19 nations. The United States is one nation. There's 19 other nations. You know, the coalition has been, minus the U.S., has been the primary lead for the training effort. Uh, the advice and assist uh, effort has been uh, a large part ours. Uh, in, in keeping with that, we've got uh, advisors at the, uh, really, the division level and the operational command level in the tactical assembly areas. Uh, we have got some advisors that will go out to uh, the brigade level uh, if uh, if required, and uh, we have the authority to go down to battalion, but we don't expect we're going to need to use that. The The primary way this operation has been run and will be run, as we've seen in the past, is really from that division level. And a lot of people ask me, you know, how, how close do you need to be? How come you're not 
farther forward. And what I tell them is, you know, when you look at our tactical operations centers, you know, all of our, our feeds for our unmanned aerial systems, all of the targeting the strikes, you know, that full situational awareness suite is in all of our operation commands. And what we saw is those uh, operational commanders and division commanders from the Iraqi army, as soon as they saw all the awareness they got, they could see their soldiers on the ground, they could see the strikes, uh, they, they started to gravitate more towards those operation commands uh, center locations. And so that's, that's where we expect the majority of our advising assist will, uh, will occur. I, I've read some discussions about JTACs. I think there's a misconception. Uh, I've read in some of the news people think that the JTACs are on the front line of troops. That's not, not where they are. They're primarily at the brigade level. Uh, and uh, controlling some of the uh, the uh, air and the strikes there, but they're not forward at, at the uh, the front line of troops or at the tip of the spear. Again, this is an Iraqi-led operation. The Iraqis are in the lead, and they're the ones fighting it. Uh, we are here enabling. We're providing capabilities. As you know, we brought some Apaches in a while ago. They've been flying at night, uh, uh, supporting any nighttime operations that uh, that the Iraqi security forces are doing, and so. Uh, my assessment is the Iraqis have the momentum and, and they're, they're going to continue to move. Uh, finally, I would just say, you know, it, again, I just want to highlight all the great work that everybody else has done before we got here. Uh, again, this has been, you know, a number of months, long months uh, in the making, and we couldn't have done what we're doing now without our higher headquarters in CENTCOM with all of those great folks I mentioned earlier that came uh, to, uh, to Iraq to really set the conditions to allow this. Uh, I'm just proud that uh, the Screaming Eagles are here. As you know, in 2003, the Screaming Eagles played a large part in liberating Mosul, and I'm just glad I'm uh, able to be Eagle 6 and watch the Screaming Eagles participate in this liberation today. Uh, that's all I've got for an opening statement. I'm, I'm happy to take your questions. Yes, sir. Before we get started, uh, just for the sake of some of our TV folks here for Baghdad, can I ask you to just to try to recenter the camera on uh, General Valesky? I think you need to come down into the right a little bit there. If they're, there you go. They're working. Perfect. Okay. Much better. Thank you. I will start with uh, Bob Burns from the Associated Press. Uh, General Valesky, um, I have a broader question, but when you mentioned the Apache, uh, the use of Apache helicopters, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that point first. I think you said they're being used in nighttime, nighttime operations. I wonder if you could elaborate exactly what, what, how they're being used. And, and my broader question is, when you were describing uh, what the Islamic State resistance has been doing, uh, part of your description was actually interrupted. The audio was interrupted a little bit. But if I understood you correctly, I think you were saying that to some extent they're falling back into the center of the city. And I'm wondering what, if that continues, what is the implication of that for the U.S. role, uh, both in terms of uh, air power, the use of air power, and also the use of JTACs, as you mentioned, they're, no, they're not at the front line now, but would that change if the fight bits centered in the, in, the, in the urban area? Thank you. I can see again. Uh, yeah, for Apaches, I mean, I'm not going to get into the, uh, the standard TTP. As you know, the, that, uh, that platform has a lot of capability to see a long range at night and uh, use its weapon systems in a a standoff capacity to strike targets, and uh, that's what they're doing. We we uh, get indications of where we expect enemy activity to be, and that's what we call their named area of interest, their NAI, and that's what we focus them on. And what we've seen is the Iraqis. It's also a confidence-building measure as they they hear those Apaches uh, in the uh, in the general area, and so that's really how we're we're using them. As far as uh, ISIL, uh, they are in fact uh, you know delaying. Uh, trying to buy space for time and really preserve the force. So, you know, when they, they have found that when they stand and fight, they die pretty quickly through a combination of strikes from us and then the Iraqis, uh, you know, continuing to, to mass on them at that point. Uh, we've seen them, uh, as, as you said, move into Mosul. I wouldn't say they're moving to the center of the city. Uh, I expect they're not going to let uh, want to let the Iraqis just walk into the city and establish a foothold. So I expect there will be some level of uh, defense there. Uh, but, you know, the, the Iraqis had to deal with the same thing in Fallujah. Uh, you know, the uh, enemy, as you know, they, they got the uh, civilian population in the middle of the city and then started to move them to the north. And we were able to conduct strikes because 
We, we are very deliberate, precise, and proportional in what we do. And it, 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 that's the, the beauty of having JTACs in an operations center where they can see everything. And, and again, all of our uh, strikes are approved by the government of Iraq. And so you know, we work together collaboratively. And, you know, the, as I said before, I worry that, you know, to tell our guys, look, we don't need to get too far ahead because you lose that situational awareness. You know, if you put, as I go out, uh, you know, back when I was here in 2004, 2008, if I went out on an observation post or I was, you know, in my vehicle at the lead edge of the column, I had no good awareness of what was going on with the rest of the formation and what, what, how to help them uh, get, accomplish their mission. And so, you know, I, I, that's how I expect that will work. And the way we did in Fallujah, you know, there were no JTACs in Fallujah. You know, we were able to continue to strike very deliberately, very precisely, and that's what I expect we'll do uh, at this time. Okay, great. Next, we'll go to Tom Bowman from National Public Radio. Uh, General, uh, you say the Iraqis have the momentum. We've been told that they're on schedule. There are no delays. Uh, I know you can't get into specifics, but give us a ballpark estimate of when you hope they'll be in Mosul. Is it several weeks? Is it a month? Uh, just your assessment of that. And also, apparently, there are um, there's been footage of um, uh, some ISIS people surrendering to the Pesh and wearing suicide vests and then blowing themselves up. Um, talk a little bit about that. Is, is that what you're seeing too? And will the uh, resulting be uh, the special care for uh, POWs? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. It's good talking to you. And I, I hear I might have the opportunity to talk to you here uh, up close. Hey, uh, the, the, I'll just address your second, uh, your second question. Um, I, I've not uh, heard that report about, uh, you know, ISIL having fighters surrender and detonating themselves. Uh, you know, as we talk about the training that we've given uh, uh, the, all the Iraqi security forces, I mean, that's part of it. You know, treating uh, POWs, if you will, or EPWs or just detainees with dignity and respect, that's part of, you know, all of the instruction that we give. I mean, it, as you know, um, the, well, it, you know, related to Fallujah, we told them, the way you go into Fallujah is going to get transmitted directly to Mosul, and that's the population that you're trying to uh, influence there. So, you know, you've got to be on, you've got to treat people with dignity and respect, or the fight becomes much, much harder in Mosul if they see that. And so they're clearly aware of that. But this is, a, if what you said is true, this is the type of enemy we're dealing with. I mean, here's the ones that are beheading people in Fallujah, or, or I'm sorry, in Fallujah they were beheading them. They're killing and murdering people in Mosul that want to leave. I mean, just the atrocities they're committing on a daily basis that they frankly put out on open source networks to let people know what they're doing. This is the type of enemy you're dealing with. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the Iraqis have fought the da this dash the entire time I've been here. So they're, they're well aware of, of the enemy threat. Uh, and they'll take a prudent measures. But, again, we, we constantly in our advise and assist role talk to them about you know, making sure you treat people with dignity and respect, as well as the populations, uh, because, you know, there's ideas, you know, how did Dash get in so quickly? They, you know, we got to treat the populations that are liberated. They've been very receptive of it, and so I, I'm, uh, we're, we're, we're confident they'll do the right thing. Could you repeat your first question again? I know you can't get specific about uh, when you're going to get into Mosul, but could you give us at least a ballpark assessment? Is it multiple weeks, a month, just a sense of that? Well, you know, I'd like them to be to Mosul tomorrow. Uh, I think they'd like to be at Mosul tomorrow. They, they, they want to get there quickly, but again, it's a hard fight. And, uh, you know, I, I, Tom, I'm not going to give you a, a time frame because you know, I want it to go earlier. So, you know, I want to under-promise and over-deliver. So you've heard all of the different pundits out there saying how long they thought it would be. I would just say tomorrow will be a lot closer to Mosul than we are today. My concern is making sure that they've got the, the combat power, they sustain that combat power, and don't go, don't go so fast that they, you know, they start to, to, you know, give opportunity to the enemy. And so that's kind of what we're advising them on, to continue to you know, maneuver in a way that they've got the security they need and they can fight the enemy. And frankly, not to ha have to turn around and go back uh, and fight uh, an enemy that's, uh, you know, that has uh, st gone to ground and stayed behind. Because that's what we expect the enemy is going to do. I mean, we're seeing it already in the Euphrates River Valley. The enemy knows they're losing. I mean, Baghdadi has said as much, you know, we'll go back out to the desert and where we've traditionally been and wait. 
Well, he, he'll get the opportunity to do that here uh, in the next uh, uh, period of time. But I expect that they're going to go into an insurgency mode, and uh, they'll, they'll try to do these high-profile, uh, spectacular attacks to draw attention away uh, from the, the losses that they're suffering. I mean, we've seen that do that before. When they lose terrain in Iraq, there's a, they try to do a spectacular attack to tell everybody, you know, they're still a relevant uh, organization. And so I, I'm not uh, telling the Iraqis to rush to Mosul. I'm telling them, you know, you've got the moment, momentum, sustain the momentum, continue to put unrelenting pressure on the enemy.